chosen in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Apostle Paul really could speak, couldn't he? Praise God. Verse 8 wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. We'll get into that. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, and whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Notice 4 said, in him, before him. Now verse 11 says, of him. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance unto the redemption of the pur purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. You can be seated. Uh, these scriptures here uh, teach you and I uh, about our eternal security in God through Jesus Christ. Amen. That is a whole lot to unpack there. We could break it down and open it up and we could take weeks and weeks, if not a year, to unpack all that's in this scripture. Uh, but today I want to focus on uh, our eternal uh, security, amen, and simply that you and I have been chosen, and it's because of Jesus that we have salvation, and it's through Jesus that we have salvation. It's because of Jesus you and I have this hope of salvation and eternally being with God, amen. To give you some related scripture, look with me in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verses 28 through 30. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. That predestinate takes people's minds and thoughts a lot of places. Predestination is simply this, for whosoever will, let him come. And we're going to get into it, but God predestined Jesus Christ to die for our sins before the physical world was even made. And what was predestined was whosoever will, let him come. Amen. Verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified, justified being interpreted just as if I never sinned. And whom he justified them, he also glorified. And then I'm going to take you to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification. Sanctification means set apart, amen. So through sanctification of the Spirit, notice that's a capital S, and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions 
which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which loved us, hath loved us and given us an everlasting consolation. Consolation means comfort. And good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Apostle Paul wants us to know we are, we are, have security in our salvation. There's a lot of teachings and heresies of this day and time that you can lose salvation. Once you have, a sal once you have salvation, you cannot lose it. Everlasting is everlasting. Forever is forever. Amen. We have been sealed. We have been adopted. So I'm hoping by the end of this lesson here, have you and I realizing if we've been born again and has trusted and chosen Christ as our Lord and Savior, uh, the predestination that God uh, had for you and I. Uh, amen. Question number one says, what was the first spiritual blessing from God to his children that Paul mentioned? We see it in verse four. Verse he said in three, blessed be the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, last week we talked about logos in the, in the Greek and the beginnings of the universe and and uh, how uh, John tied that to Genesis 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, signifying that Jesus Christ uh, uh, was pre-existent, and Jesus Christ was there with the Father and the Spirit in creation. So now we see in Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. We find our answer in verse 4, According as He had chosen us, in him before the foundation of the world. So what was the first spiritual blessing from God to his children that Paul mentioned? It was simply that we are chosen. We're chosen by God. That's the first spiritual blessing that he's given you and I. Like we mentioned, it's before the foundation of the world. Now you can jot it down in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. You'll find this before the foundation. You also find it again in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. And then also in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, he says, He that was slain before the foundation of the world. So this is spiritual. We know Christ was not slain before the foundation of the world. He created the world. But when he came born of the virgin, he then when God prepared him the body, conceived of the Holy Ghost and the virgin womb of Mary, that was his ministry here on earth to die for the sins of of the world. So we can say it was already in God's mind, it was already in God's heart, and he already foreknew that his son, Jesus Christ, would die for our sin. Amen. For the penalty you and I owe. So the first spiritual blessing from God to his children for you and I is that he has simply chosen us. Uh, don't it feel good when you, uh, well, well, I see it every year, vacation Bible school, there's usually a day where they play uh, kickball and uh, they get two cats. And don't it always feel good or when you was younger playing basketball or something and you had to pick team, somebody picked you. Didn't it feel good? Or if you was the last one but still you was picked uh, to be on that team, amen. It, it ought to be something special. And you and I ought to live our lives in such a way that we understand that Christ has chosen us. I believe everybody that comes to Sunday school comes to Sunday school for a reason, amen. Devil didn't send you here. Devil don't want you here. Don't want me here. Don't want you here. Amen. We have been chosen in Christ. Uh, therefore, we are blessed, Apostle Paul uh, says, in heaven. Amen. With these spiritual blessings. Amen. Our blessings is not always physical needs and material things of this earth. He said, set your treasure in heaven where moth and corruption I do not uh, enter in. Amen. Question number two, if you went over your questions this week, question number two says, what is an anatomy and what two truths in Scripture fit this description? An, anon an anonymy is two truths that seemingly contradict themselves. What does that mean? When two truths are stated in the Bible, that seems to contradict themselves. And it says, what are these two that Apostle Paul here, uh, that fits this description? God is sovereign, yet you and I have got to choose Him. What does that mean? God is infinite. God don't end. But we're finite. He created us. So God has given us His Word. And if it's in here, you and I can bank on it. But here's the thing. Paul said, 
we know in part. But there's going to come a time where we know in whole. The simple, the most simple, some people, you can really dig in this and, and, and get confused, and there's a lot of teachings and things out there. It's this simple. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Amen. So when the Bible says that God is completely sovereign, he is. He knows everything. But to you and I, it's also seemingly contradicting that you and I choose him. Amen. It says we are predestined in him, right? That you and I were chosen before the foundation of the world. But then the Bible says for whosoever will let him come because that comes it says by grace through faith are you saved not of works least any man should boast it's all about relationship the faith comes from relationship with Christ amen uh, question number three says what place what took place in Roman adoption I like this and how does it illustrate our adoption by God we see in verses five through six <clears throat> Verse 4 said we was chosen in him that we would be without blame before him in love. Now watch this, verse 5. Having predestinated us for whosoever will let him come that would accept him unto the adoption. Now this is where it makes sense because it's adoption. Amen. It ain't that we was, uh, it ain't that, that we was already whoever's going to heaven's going to heaven and whoever's going to hell's going to hell. That's not so, amen. That's Calvinism, uh, amen. It's a for whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. And for God so gave, loved the world that he gave his only God's Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Red, yellow, black, white, tall, short, fast, skinny, no matter where you're from, what you've done. Jesus Christ died for the sin of the world, but you must come to him. And when you do, here it is, verse 5. Having predestinated us, that whosoever will, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So it was good pleasure that God wanted you and I to be adopted into his family out of faith. Amen. And so the question is, what took place in Roman adoption and how does it illustrate our adoption by God? So at the moment when in, Roman, in, in, in the Roman uh, period, when someone was adopted, at the moment the papers were signed and they put a seal on that piece of paper, at that moment you have completely cut ties with the past of who uh, who you was born to or where you was uh, who you was with. Amen. If you uh, this day and time you have you have orphanages, you have uh, adopted parents, and maybe something happened or but the, once you was adopted, you have completely cut ties with the past, and you have now took on to who it is that is adopting you, you have took them on just as if it's a natural biological birth. Amen. So everything in the past is erased and everything starts off brand new. Amen. Ain't that the same when you and I get born again? When you and I accept Jesus Christ, the old man is dead, it's gone, it's in the past, God don't bring it up no more, it's thrown in the depths of the sea. People around us can throw up our sin, we can even bring it up ourselves, but as far as God is concerned, he has no idea what it is because he has chosen to forget it. Amen. So this, uh, what took place in Roman adoption, at the moment of adoption, the old is erased and the new as if, and that is as natural as biological. I like this. It always sticked out to me. Cody Zorn, one time he preached, uh, he had preached on the adoption and he was talking about pottery and uh, how, how we're the clay and God's the potter and he got studying that out, and he said at the very end, Brother Mark, when they, uh, when they, when they, when when God gets done molding this clay, and He's making what it is God wants to make with it, uh, that God puts a seal on it. Yeah. That 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 whoever it was, that the potter would put a seal on it, and that's the same way with you and I. As when we've come to God and we've been adopted, we're going to get down here in just a few questions down. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. We have been sealed with the promises of God. So I like that. Uh, just the second that you and I, at the second we have trusted Christ, at the second we've been convicted of our sin and seen our need of the Savior and we have accepted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the righteousness of God has been applied to you. 
We have become an heir to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Ain't that wonderful? He no longer sees you and I. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. He sees him and not you and I. Amen. That's what makes it equal ground. I love the fact, Brother Sam, that in the family of God, there's no big eyes and there's no little use. Preachers ain't better than deacons. Deacons ain't better than laymen. Nobody's better than anybody else. We're all equal ground at the cross. One body, many members. Amen. Thank God for that. Question number uh, four says, What is the meaning of redemption and what are the results of our having been redeemed? We see it. Apostle Paul uh, goes on to say, look with me, in, in verse 7 it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of His grace. So the question is, what is the meaning of redemption? Redemption means to be bought back, to be released from captivity, to have liberty, to be uh, set free. So Apostle Paul here says that we have been redeemed and set free from our sinful path and from a destination of hell through the blood of Jesus Christ. A pawnbroker is somebody that you can go to and he will give you money in exchange for something that you own. And at a certain time, you can come back and, and give that person that money, and they usually have some type of interest on it, more money, and you buy that back. God says in his word that you and I have been redeemed. We have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He has purchased you and I. Once you have accepted Jesus Christ as your own Lord and Savior, you changed your mind, want to go to hell, you couldn't. And nobody's that dumb to want to change your mind and go to hell, amen. But the fact of the matter is you can't. You're God. You're bought with a price, amen. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that, amen. All right, so this word uh, redemption means to be released from captivity, uh, amen. It results in your and I freedom of life. Are we perfect? No, I'm not bound to that old sin. Thank God I'm not bound to who I used to be, amen. Am I tempted? Sure. And am, am I still have flesh? Sure. My soul saved in my spirit and my body, ain't amen. We have a fight. We have a battle. But there is something that took place there. That redemption, when you've been bought, when you are on, you just know that you're His. And there's some things you just can't do no more. You're bought with a price. Amen. Thank God that you and I have been uh, redeemed as God's children. Amen. Question number five says, what was God's motive in giving all these blessings to his own. Look with me in the next verse in 8. And remind you, we could break these down a whole lot more. We just don't have time. Uh, but for the, for the lesson's sake, we're, we're getting to the points of being chosen in Christ. All right, verse 8 says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Amen. So the question is, what was God's motive in giving us all these blessings to his own for the wisdom and for the prudence so that you and I could understand. When we get born again, we don't understand at all. Amen. When I got saved, I didn't know. I knew some verses and I had heard some things when I was younger. I knew for God so loved the world. There's a few words that I messed up in trying to uh, 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 quote that verse. And there was things that I knew. Jesus died on the cross. There were some other things there. But when we get born again, there's an understanding that God gives you and I uh, there's wisdom that you and I obtain through the knowledge of this book that we couldn't before. I remember when I was lost, I'd read that book. I'd, I'd, I'd try to. I'd try to. I was a sinful man. I don't know about you, but I was a sinful man. And, and sometimes that would make me feel good. And I would try to start reading this book. I could never get out of the law. I'd get in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, but I could never get out of it. And when I got born again, when I started to read that book, after I got saved, it, it went from here to here. When that took place, all of a sudden I seen the word Lord everywhere and I never seen it before. As a miracle in my own life, I don't understand it and I don't know why, but when I used to read Genesis through, uh, throughout my life, Genesis through, and the Torah, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, I didn't see the word Lord, but I now do. Amen. I, I thank God for that. So there is uh, blessings that God give you and I once we receive. There's an understanding, but you've got to understand too that God has given us His word and we must take him at his word, but we're not going to understand it all. We're not meant to understand it all. Just like our children, we know they don't understand it all, and we don't expect them to know it all. That you can, there's, there's sermons everywhere, 
especially God has used my children through my life to show me there's times when my son does something uh, and it just reminds me that God is doing the same for me or looking at me that way or guiding me that way. Uh, so there's things that you and I, God has given us, this knowledge, and wisdom is knowledge applied to our life. But here's where prudence comes in. Prudence is the action of wisdom. See, we can know this book, but until we apply it to our life and put it in action, we're not going to get really nowhere when it comes to understanding. That's why a lot of Christians sit idle. They read the book from time to time, but if you'll read it, and you'll just keep reading it, and you just keep reading it, you gain the knowledge of it, and all of a sudden you start applying it to your life, you're walking in wisdom, and it gives you the action, the prudence of keeping this wisdom and walking this way. We must, because we have an enemy. You and I have been chosen in Christ, and you and I don't only have the enemy of the devil, but we also have the enemy of our flesh, amen, and others flesh around us at times. It ain't always the devil, the devil got that person against me. Sometimes it's just their flesh. Just like we can't blame everything on the devil, we simply have flesh, amen, and natural desires and thoughts and things uh, of this world and of this body that you and I uh, face. But God has given you and I his own understanding or his knowledge that you and I can apply it to our lives, amen, to walk in prudence, amen. Question number six says, what is a biblical mystery? If you look with me in verse nine, after he says that he hath abounded toward us wisdom and prudence, and this is why I watch nine, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, amen. So the question is, what is a biblical mystery? Mystery. A biblical mystery is a spiritual truth that is being revealed or has been revealed. See, Apostle Paul is writing these epistles, and he was a man that studied the law. And when Christ came on the scene, when grace showed up, it completely got rid of the teachings of the law, of keeping the law. So uh, Jesus here, so the, the mystery uh, is, so good example is the Jew and the Gentile. So it was the Jew. He was the God of the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. But then the mystery is unveiled through time and through the teachings of Apostle Paul from Revelation to God. In 1 Peter it says, uh, For the word came not in the time of old uh, by will of men, but by holy men of God, as the Holy Ghost moved upon them and they spake. So a biblical mystery is something that was once not known, but is revealed or is being revealed. So here, you got to understand that we glean from this book. But back then, when he's writing to the church of Ephesus, he's trying to let them understand that they're, of their spiritual security in Christ and that it's not works and the love that God has toward you and I by the things he's allowed us to know and to see. Amen. That, that there can be some of the most educated men when it comes to this book, don't see the first spiritual truth in it. And there's some, I, I have heard preachers that cannot even read this book, but they're called of God, and they have been with Jesus. Ignorant and unlearned, but they took notice that they've been with Jesus. Amen. It's all about Him, and it's all about what He gives uh, to you and I. It ain't never about us, amen, but it's about His spiritual blessings. And the mysteries that was once hidden is now revealed. It's also to us personally. There's things that God allows us to know. As you grow in Christ, there's more things that make sense. Amen. When I first got saved, I, I thought everybody was lost. Amen. I'm telling you, I did. When I got saved, I thought everybody was lost. Well, he's doing that, she's doing that, she's doing that. As you learn and as you grow and as you apply this book to your life, amen, God will slowly rebuild to you. God can give it to you all at once. He just can. That's why sanctification is a process. We grow in the things of Christ. But if you get to a point in that book where he's told you something and you don't apply it to your life, you're going to go idle and you're not going to grow. We have a lot of stagnant, stagnant Christians. You ever seen one of them ditches or creeks where the water stopped flowing to it and it gets green and it gets stuff building on top of it and the water stink and you see fish coming to the top and, and they're dying and things ain't, there's just no good there. But then you see some of them waters where the water flows through it and it's doing what's because that water's not stagnant. It's not saying it's flowing. Amen. You and I need to grow in the knowledge and the wisdom of this book 
apply it to our lives, amen, uh, that God can continue to reveal to you and I what he needs to, uh, amen. That's why it's always a blessing when you read this book and the man of God gets behind the pulpit and he preaches it and, and, and it bears witness with what you've studied or what God has shown you and then God uses the man and he's just doing what he does with God and how God bears witness and he starts bearing witness with people in the church and things that people say. There, there's sometimes, uh, don't get me wrong, I always take away from the preaching of God's word, but there's been sometimes it was just one little thing that somebody in the church said right before I walked out the door. Or it's one little thing that somebody said to me when I walked in the door where God spoke to me, where God revealed something to my heart. He's a personal God. Amen. He's a per- we ain't receiving revelations to this book. This book is settled in heaven. This is God's work. And this is the book will be judged out of the things written in the book. But God to you and I does reveal our mysteries even personally to ourselves. Amen. And that's why it's so important to read this book over and over and over and over. It's alive. It will always speak a different way. It's alive. One man could preach a passage and the next man could preach a passage. You could take, you could take ten men and tell them to preach from these five verses. And preach this sermon title and I guarantee every single one of them will have a different sermon. Why this book is alive. Hallelujah. It's wonderful. All right. Question number number eight. uh, I'm sorry. Seven says, what mystery, remember, that was being revealed or that is revealed that was once hidden or is hidden. What mystery did Paul mention in this week's text and when will this mystery be fulfilled. Look with me in verse 10. He goes on to say, I remember this was his good pleasure, making known unto us the mystery of his will. Verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together watch it, in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven which are on earth and even in him. So what mystery is Apostle Paul talking about here this time? It is God's gathering. Amen. We see when Christ died on the cross, it was the first fruits, amen. Right now, we're living to dispensate. That was a, you had the the dispensation of the law and of the prophets, and now uh, we're living the dispensation of grace, amen. But in the raptures uh, going to take place, God, people, all that's been saved, born again, will leave this earth for seven years. We'll come back after that seven years, if that's the tribulation on earth, where the mark of the beast takes place. But it says, then we'll come back, Armageddon, amen. There's a thousand-year millennial reign where Jesus Christ sits here in the throne of David, amen, uh, in Jerusalem, and he'll rule and reign for a thousand years. After that will be the great white throne judgment, and then we'll go into eternity, and eternity will go on and on and to eternity. So this is the mystery. And see, this was all new to them. These are people that are coming out from studying the law. And all of a sudden, it's the Jew, it's the Gentile, and God bringing all things together. Ain't you glad that He's the God for anybody? He's the God for everybody. There wasn't one person, wasn't one sin that Jesus Christ didn't die for. Amen. And one day, He's going to bring it all together and said, it'll be there no more bond, no more free, no more male, no more female. It ain't going to be no more black, no more white. It's going to be God in the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm looking forward uh, to that. Amen. So that's the mystery that he's talking about here of how God's going to bring all things together. And you and I in the church age, when we accept Christ, have been adopted because God predestined that whosoever will, when Christ died, let him come. Amen. It was just like before. Before the cross, it was faith. It's always been about faith. It wasn't about keeping that law. Though they were supposed to keep that law and they tried to keep that law, ain't you trying to do your best? Ain't you trying not to sin? Ain't you trying to be better each day? Amen. It's about faith and our love and relationship with God. Amen. Praise God. All righty. Question number eight says, what does our inheritance in Christ include? So that's the mystery that was being revealed. Now... Uh, what's the inheritance? I'm going to go ahead and read 11 through 14. We're running out of time. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him. It was God's purpose for you and I to have fellowship with Him, to be with Him by accepting Him, who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, because it's what He wanted. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory, 
who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So what does our inheritance include in Christ? It's heaven. Because of Christ, because of what He did, we get to inherit heaven. But you've got to look at it this way too. If we're bought with a price, it ain't just us that inherit. It's Christ that inherits you and I. Just as much as you and I, I understand we have good days and high mountains, and I understand there's sometimes we just say, Come, Lord Jesus. Even so, ain't you glad He's long suffering until the other ones can get saved? But just as much as you and I yearn at times and long, I do, I don't know about you, to be with Christ, He's just yearning and longing to be with you and I. There's going to be one day, He's a son, go get your church. He's going to step off in glory. Amen. And He's going to come get His church. So it ain't just that you and I are inheriting heaven but you and I also uh, are being inherited by Christ. Therefore, you and I have received the Holy Spirit. That's why he says we've been sealed. Because our flesh is not saved, he has put the seed. There is something inside of me. Uh, it really stood out to me, and I was actually studying it. And the first night that Rick Prophet preached in our revival, this last this past revival, he, he was, I think he was praying. He said, there's something in me that can't sin. And I was doing my own little study at home about that. And that's the seed of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit. There's something in you that can't sin. There's something in me that can't sin. It's the Holy Spirit. He can't sin. That's why when our flesh sins, we grieve Him. You lose your happiness. You just, things ain't right. You know that there's no pleasure in it. Amen. Uh, you lose your joy when you're in sin. Because the Holy Ghost, which can't sin, is grieved. Amen. And it makes you feel down in the dumps and deflated. Right? Amen. So what does our inheritance in Christ include? Our inheritance is heaven. Christ's inheritance is us. And you and I inherited the Holy Spirit of God that comes and indwells in you and I. Amen. Question number nine says, What is it that redounds to the praise of the glory of Jesus? I ain't going to lie to you. I had to look up that word redounds. I didn't know what that means. Amen. Uh, but what it means is like a direct response. So the fact that you and I have been born again. The fact that you and I inherit heaven, the, our reaction ought to be praising God. Our reaction ought to be a holy hand. Our reaction might, should be wanting to come to church to worship God, to come to Sunday school, to grow in the things of God, to learn of God, to praise Him, to worship Him, to sing for Him, to preach for Him, to teach for Him. Whatever you do, it might be to clean for Him. It might be to cook for Him. It might be to comfort other people. It might be to... Whatever God tells you to do, it ought to your direct response uh, uh, to, to go into heaven and because of what Christ has done for you, it ought to be for you and I to praise God. Our life ought to be unto the praise for this inheritance that you and I have received. What, what, what else is there? Think about it. Well, once you and I have been born again, what, what's out there that's greater than our inheritance? What's greater than the Lord Jesus Christ? What's, what's greater? There's nothing greater than God and the fact that He lives inside of us and the fact that when He sees us, He don't see us, He sees Him. Amen. Amen. He sees perfection. Question number 10, last question, we're out of time. What does the presence of the Holy Spirit within us guarantee? We've seen it there in 13 and 14. It says, uh, In whom ye also, 13, In whom after you trust that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you've been saved, in whom also after that you believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest. We've been sealed with the Holy Ghost of God. That, that yearning you and I have that directs us to church. I used not to have that. I don't know about you, but I didn't and I do now. I used not to have that to pick up this book. And when I'd see it and it was dusty and, and I was such a sinful man, I'd pick it up and it's just like, man, I'll read that right there. There is, a, there is something new that has took inside since I've been sealed that says read that book, that says pray unto me, that says trust me, that says I'll get you through it, that says do and live your life for me. Ain't that wonderful? That's the, that's the seal. But see, it says that's the earnest of our inheritance. This word earnest means it's a down payment. Like you go for a car and you just give a down payment on it and then you pay that thing off. See, Christ has already paid it off. 
that you and I have this down payment, so to say. We've been sealed. Why? He's leaving us here. He said, I go to prayer place, that where I am there you may be also. But he simply have left us here. We are adopted to the family cars. We're peculiar people now that we can spread the gospel. Why? Because predestination is for whosoever will, let them come. Amen. Ain't you glad about that? He says, we know in part, but when we see him as he am, we'll be like unto him and we'll know in whole. Amen. You and I, because of this presence of God inside of you and I, when God tells you to shout, you ought to shout. When God tells you to sing, you ought to sing. When God tells you to testify, you ought to testify. When God tells you to throw a holy hand, you ought to throw a holy hand. When God tells you to go to the altar and pray, pray. There have been times I didn't know why God was telling me to go to that altar. There was one time years ago, and we're done. Uh, there was one time years ago, I felt the draw to come to the altar and pray. And I really didn't understand why, but I went down there and I started praying for people in salvation. Lord, save somebody. And I tried to get up and I almost felt like I couldn't get up. I just, I felt a weight on me. And I just kept praying, Lord, save somebody. Lord, somebody. And they didn't turn the music off. And all of a sudden, and you was probably here that night, brother. All of a sudden, this guy stood up. He was sitting about where Elaine is. And he stood up and he said, can, 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 we, we, can, we, sing, can we sing one more verse? And he come down to the altar and he give his life to Christ. Amen. Sometimes you and I, we don't understand, but I, we ought to, because God has been so good to us and been so gracious to us and He has sealed us, we ought to obey Him. We ought to do the things He tells us to do. If He tells you to pray, come pray. If you've never been born again, God tells you to come get born again, come get born again. But if you've been born again, this altar ain't just for people that are lost. It ought to be full with saints that praise God for what He's done for us because He has sealed us. He has promised you and I something way better and far beyond what our mind right now can even understand. Well, without faith, it is impossible to please Him.